uh, sort of the overview. I'm going to talk a bit about my, my usual area of research, ultra rapid visual categorization. I'll t tell you why I think the brain does an amazing job at uh, processing of uh, pictures of scenes and so on. Uh, uh, this puts a lot of temporal constraints on how the brain must be doing things because when you get a number for how, how long it takes to make some computation and you look, then you look at the, the anatomy and the physiology of the system, you can make some statements about how it must be done. And that's sort of, a lot of my career has been built around that, that sort of idea of trying to take what we know about the anatomy and the physiology of the visual system and try and work out what that says about how the information is encoded and how, we, uh, how the sort of computations get done. Uh, I'll be stressing the importance of coding with spikes. Um, I'm, I'm, now, not everybody believes this. I'm, I'm, no, one of my main aims in my career now is to convince John that he should be using spikes. <laughs> but uh, basically, um, you know, uh, you'll see there are plenty of examples of computational vision systems that do a very good job with, with, with you know, continuous activation values, and they do work. But I'm going to try and convince you that, there, that adding spikes in a system has lots of other interesting advantages. Um, I'll go back to convolutional neural networks, which I've been sort of interested in for uh, quite some time. And, 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 and as John was mentioning, we actually created a company that does convolutional neural networks, SpikeNet technology, back in 1999. Uh, SpikeNet. Uh, and I'll talk about the current state of the art in con convolutional neural networks, which, in case you didn't know, since 2012, just walk, you know, wipe the floor with any any uh, competing uh, computer vision system, uh, 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 and that's really has uh, really and, and you know, I don't have to tell you this in Toronto because it's Jeff, Jeff Hinton's group that, that, that basically uh, showed that this was this was the way to do it, and that's essentially what everybody is doing now: convolutional neural networks, except that um, those sort of things like supervision and Google Net and things like this use an, a training algorithm which I think is no way that it could be in, in, uh, involved in the brain. You basically, you train the system with like, you know, literally billions of training cycles with labeled data, and that's not what we do. And so the, the missing thing is again, spikes, I think. And I'm gonna try and convince you that there's a, a learning rules that we can use based on spike time dependent plasticity which uh, actually allow systems to build themselves with no supervision and that's that's the sort of that's the bottom line i think so you know spike spike spikes <coughs> for coding and for learning so just a little bit on uh, ultra rapid visual processing this is my number one hit i suppose <coughs> this was where we we flashed to, uh, this was when it was the beginning of when you could buy um, uh, uh, lots of images. So Coral, I think a Canadian company, I think uh, they uh, that you could sell. You could buy a big box full of CD-ROMs, and we sort of bought these sixty thousand images. Lots of them were animals, and we just sort of flashed them on the screen and said, "Is there an animal or not?" No, no, uh, no idea what sort of animal to look for. But people are just incredibly efficient at this, and not only uh, do they have short reaction times, uh, you know, sending. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, ref no reflection screen. Uh, the, the reaction time is around 400 milliseconds, down about 2 280 minimum. Uh, but uh, the, the really interesting thing was these uh, uh, event related potentials where the green curve is just average across all the targets, animals, the red ones were distracted, <coughs> and the two curves sort of superimposed and then split at 150 milliseconds. So we said, you know, even this hard uh, task can be done at 150 milliseconds. Um, it turns out that actually uh, vision can be even faster. We've got another task, uh, circadian towards faces. Uh, then this was uh, basically if you flash up two pictures and you just ask people to circade to the side where there's a face. You, uh, you can in introspect on this, but basically uh, you can do that uh, with latencies of 100 milliseconds. That's the eye moving. Uh, the you know presumably. Uh, the brain may uh, send the signal out maybe 20 milliseconds before that. So we're talking about 80 milliseconds after the stimulus comes on. You know which side it's on, which is you know, non-trivial. Um, but I wasn't the first to, person to discover that vision was fast. But back in the, in the 80s, Molly Potter had already shown that you know, at 10 frames a second, these are just pictures of animals. And you basically get the impression you see them all. 
So to make life a little bit harder, I'm going to show you some more pictures of animals at 10 frames a second. And there's one image that I want you to notice, hopefully, because it's an odd man out. So pay attention. <laughs> Has anybody it wasn't watched? an odd man out. <laughs> and this, this is probably the most you know, iconic image in, in, in our civilization, probably. So this is an easy one. How about this one? <laughs> That's more interesting because there are, there are an infinite number of angles that, that picture could be taken from. It's still, still made to work. And um, maybe one more. <laughs> so Mickey Mouse is actually an animal, and yet it was sufficiently different from the other stuff. And well, you might have heard and seen me give this talk before, but that, that particular picture, we just I just took it from nowhere particularly, but it, it you know generally works. So. You know, I think we're having to process all of the images. Not, you don't just process the Mona Lisa. You have to process the other ones to know that they are all animals, because it's the, the it's the category uh, uh, difference which is important. The animals are sort of inhibiting each other at a at a sort of high conceptual level, and when you change the category, then whatever it is will tend to sort of stick in your memory. But this sort of um, I, call, I, mean, I think this is activating memories, and if I sort of show you the, these, this is a slowed down a bit, this is two frames a second, and you know, all of these things will almost certainly be instantly recognized, instantly, not, not quite instantly, but very, very rapidly recognizable. And, uh, and this, is, you know, this is our culture, it's all stored in our visual systems, I think, with, with these things. And, oh, that last one, what was that? So, I mean, I presume most people here know what that is, right? It's that. That Dalmatian picture that I saw you <laughs> in the one. But um, if there is anybody here, um, Casey, maybe you don't know that this is a Dalmatian dog here. This is a very famous picture in, in psychology. Once you've seen that, you've basically got it for your life, I think. I mean, I think you could probably do that experiment with students who, are, who haven't done any psychology for 20 years and they'd say, oh, it's that, psych uh, that, that, that thing I saw in Psych 101. So we're storing. You know, maybe in 10 seconds in a lecture, you store this pattern, and it's there for the rest of your life. So the sort of questions you need to ask is, how does the brain do this? I mean, it's, it's pretty impressive. And, and can you build a machine that could do that sort of thing? Well, um, so this is where I sort of wind back in time to the, the, the 80s. Um, um, I published this paper with Michel Ambert, Biological Constraints on Connectionist Modeling, um, in which I, I was starting from the fact, I, I did my thesis, as, uh, as John was saying, in Edmund Rolls's lab, and in the, in the office next to me, you, you were there at the same time, weren't we? <laughs> in the office next to me, there was Dave Perrett, um, uh, flashing pictures of faces, uh, and, and this is, a, this is a, uh, a neuron in monkey IT, and it fires at 100 milliseconds, nice sharp latency, whenever the monkey sees a, a face, or even a drawing of a face, or a photograph of a face. And so I knew that the, you know um, you can get through all of this sort of stuff. This is um, this is going from the retina. You have to go through about ten layers of neurons, I figured, you know, roughly. Uh, and these neurons at the top start being firing at 100 milliseconds. So I sort of back of an envelope calculation. That basically means you go through ten layers of neurons in 100 milliseconds. Ten milliseconds a layer. Uh, how many spikes do I get in, in 10 milliseconds? Well, most neurons don't fire above 100 spikes per second, so you're probably going to get one spike. And all of this was making it unlikely that uh, these feedback loops, which exist, had time to work. And so I made this list of uh, claims. The visual system is arranged in that massively parallel, mostly up clear feet forward, left with 10 left legs, etc. I was making a number of, this is basically hand waving, but it was all entirely based on that, that latency, and you know, a bit of uh, my knowledge of how many layers there were in the visual system. But there are things in here like uh, firing rate can't be used, basically, because uh, if you've only got one spike, you're not going to be able to measure a firing rate. It's yes or no, that's all you get. Of course, I wasn't the only person who was saying interesting things like this. Jerry Feldman and John were also making points about uh, you know, the of Jerry Feldman is a hundred step limit and things. So the, the, the idea that you know, you know, he was saying you know, half a second to make a judgment. Neurons fire spikes at most every five second, milliseconds. You only got a hundred steps, and therefore that was one of the reasons why I really moved into PDP at the time was because of that. 
but also um, Leonard Ewer, uh, who, uh, this is actually what he said, recorded from neurons in monkeys' temporal motor cortex that are sensitive to a face, or even a particular face, show that they respond in only 70 to 200 milliseconds. Therefore, the serial depth of processing is extremely shallow, <coughs> probably only a few dozen or a few hundred at most. That was in 1987, so it preceded me. I only found that afterwards. So, but I, I think you can probably even claim to be the first person to say the latency is really, what well, I think he's been very generous, uh, a few hundred steps. I think it's actually 10. Um, so, you know, this is a sort of scheme that I would be, you know, flash up an image, you have to go through all this stuff. These neurons here are firing to faces, or actually anything that the monkey is trained to recognize. If you train a monkey on paper clips, you get neurons that are selected to these things. But you can't make your hand move without going through a whole load of other stuff. So this was, this is putting some pretty serious constraints. And so feed forward processing, um, not that you don't have feedback, but you just don't have any time to do it. You only get a few milliseconds per stage. Essentially one swipe per neuron, uh, so it's very sparse as well, because the first neurons to fire, almost by definition, have to be very sparse. I mean, these are... <laughs> <laughs> um, this wave of spikes going from the visual system, the first neurons have to fire on their own. I mean, it, it has to be you know, excessively sparse at the beginning. The question is, how, how much can you do with just that very sparse stuff? Also, uh, importantly, you, you can do this process with no context to help. You, know, you don't have to know that you're looking for the, the Statue of Liberty. I mean, the brain comes out with the answer on anyway. And you know, I think this is the raises of the question how you can do this coding with only one spike per neuron. So the classic view, I think, is that you know, neurons, you've got neurons coming in with an ascending spike, but for many people, essentially, um, you know, okay, we've got these spikes coming here, but we're, we want to convert those into floating point numbers, and that's what we're going to compute with. And then this neuron here is going to do some sort of weighted sum and things, and then come up with another floating point number, which we're going to convert into a firing rate using a Poisson process. This, I mean, people do think that this might be plausible. Uh, in other words, spikes don't ma matter. I mean, we, we should be doing everything with floating point numbers in a, in a GPU, uh, and basically, um, and that's all we have to do. But there, there are plenty of people already thinking about temporal coding. So, you know, this is where spikes do matter. That uh, the temporal patterning here is is critical. It's not just counting numbers of spikes or measuring the interval between two spikes. And so, you know, things like synchrony and you know all the Wolfsinger stuff was all all based on that. And repeating patterns as well. <coughs> um, and then there's sort of my my alternative. I think I think it's an alternative where. Even with one spike per neuron, you can get a huge amount of data from looking at the ordering of the spikes. And this particular intensity profile, you can, you can read it out by looking at just which neurons fire first. Um, because the most activated neurons will tend to fire first. And so temporal coding can be used even for stimuli which are not temporally structured. If you flash an image on the retina, even if it has no motion or anything, you're going to turn it into a, just a, a, a very rich leaf pattern wave of spikes. And so that means that you can do computation even when only when each neuron only, only emits one spike. So in this case, the firing rate is one spike for all neurons. If you were using rate coding, there's nothing you can learn. Um, it's, it's all very simple, really, because you know, a neuron is like a, a capacitor with a threshold. And if you've got a, a weak stimulus, it, the time taken to get to the threshold is longer than when you have a stronger stimulus. So I think that has to be has to be the case. And indeed, I think it's rather amusing that if you go back to Lord Adrian's recordings from the uh, uh, optic nerve, I forgot what animal this is. But this is this is the very first recordings from sensory fibers. He compares uh, this is the sort of a population in the uh, in the optic nerve with a low intensity and a high intensity stimulus. And what you can notice is that, yeah, the firing rate is higher with a higher intensity stimulus than here. You get a very big difference in the, in the maintained firing rate. This is much bigger than this. But you can also see that the latency is shorter. This latency here is, is reduced substantially when you increase in intensity. That was in the very first studies of any recordings back in 1929. And for some reason, Everybody got obsessed with rate coding and, and, and neglected the fact that even with a flash stimulus, there was huge amounts of data in the timing spikes. 
So in the optic nerve, where you've got a, a million fibers coming out of the back, and these, these fibers are, you know, you're taking this, uh, the, the, the receptors here and doing some processing in the retina and then sending information to the brain. Of course, it's the wrong way around because nature put the receptors on the back rather than the front. But those, the, these, these ganglion cells are, you know, you can sim think of them, some of them at least, doing a sort of a simple convolution excited by the center, inhibited by the surrounding. So as you increase the contrast, the latency of these neurons will get shorter and shorter. And if you've got you know, um, on and off center cells at different scales, you know, then that gives you uh, a very rich set of stuff. So um, you know, here we've got new cells firing, firing spikes, and there's, there's massive amounts of data in there. Um, and here I'm going to show you how you can reconstruct a, a, an image for a, a simple 32 by 32 pixel retina uh, as a function of time. So this is the number of spikes seen so far. And at some point, you'll probably have to tell what it is. And you can sort of say, well, how many spikes did I need to get to that level? And the fact is, you don't need very many. And the more, the bigger the retina, the easier it is. So this is what we showed with Ruth and Van Ruben, um, where we took that same toy retina. We, we used it to. Uh, process in flash an image and just use the ordering of spikes coming out of this. So each of these neurons is, is, fire, is ramping up to threshold, fires a spike, and um, this is the percentage of, of, of neurons that are fired. And uh, you can see that you, know, you don't need very many to actually work out what something is. So if I stop that there and say, is there an animal, you might have a bit of difficulty. And it's getting easier. Yeah. You can, you can see what it is now, right? I mean, so, uh, and the reason why I only need 0.5% of my cells to fire spikes is because the first cells to fire are the ones that are, are, are saying the strongest signal. So the brain wants to put high prior priority and high value on anything that comes through early. And in fact, you can basically forget the other 99% of the cell at the fire. Yeah. So you're basically uh, inferring a temporal code for contrast. Yes. 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 So we actually compared in this paper using rate coding with a Poisson code, with with just using the first spike, and uh, it was you know it was very very clear that anybody trying to use a Poisson code would you know fail. I mean, if you were if you were if you were net natural selection, you had to compare uh, reconstruction of an image based on the first spike with a Poisson rate code. Um, you know, you get eaten if you use Poisson rate code. Um, so, armed with this, we actually uh, set, uh, um, um, did some just to, to see what would happen if we um, tried to build a system based on this. So this is a paper with Arnaud de Long, where we took an image and we did this trick of converting it into um, a wave of spikes. And we just had eight oriented maps of different oriented filters, and then we sent the spikes from these oriented maps into actually 40 maps uh, with a sort of convolutional neural network um, to, uh, this was with the Olivetti face database. So here's, the, here's one of the images. This is, this is the pattern of firing in the, in the on and off pathways. These are the eight orientation maps. And then we've got 40 types of receptive fields, uh, one for each of the 40 people in the Olivetti face database. And you can see that what we've done is just picked off the first firing spikes of the different orientations, and this allows you to build a sort, of, uh, a sort of receptive field. And you can see here, this little white dot here, means that the first neuron to fire out of all of these neurons here was the F2 neuron, which actually is the right face. Arno um, did a sort of montage, whoops, sorry, uh, yeah. a montage with all 400 faces from the Olivetti face database. So there are 10 views of each of uh, each person. And all the ones with a, gre a green um, rectangle around means that the, the map for that person fired first at that point in the image, and it was the right one. There are eight, uh, there are seven errors, the red ones here. So we're getting, you know, um, whatever that is, 97% or something uh, correct. And, and we're only using one spike and we're only using the output of V1. And the resistance to contrast uh, is 
is remarkable because you can get down to sort of 1.5% contrast. This is, you know, you can't see anything anymore, but it's still the same neurons that fire first. And since we only care about the ones that fire first, this is actually quite good. And we can, we can you know, randomize 50% of the pixels and it still works. Um, Hugh. Just one more question. You require relative latencies here. Uh, in this and that one, requires a comparison between neurons of some sort. How, how do you envision that as Okay, so uh, uh, at this time, I actually thought that we were using a, a true rank code. So you go A, then B, then C, then D, then E. Actually, it's even simpler. You just pick off the first N percent of neurons to fire, and that's all you need to know. I'm, I'm giving you away spike next to your trade secrets here, by the way. But, um, <laughs> but basically, uh, well, you don't that. need to know the precise relative timing. You just need to know that. I want to know the first 1% of the neurons to fire. That's all I need to know. But, but you're saying that it has to be relative to something. You can't say oh, first okay. unless you know when the start is. Okay, I'm assuming. I'm assu okay, right. If there was spontaneous activity, you get a wave of spikes on top of the spontaneous activity. You can still do the same trick. But um, for this, there was zero spontaneous sure. activity. There was one spike maximum per neuron, and, and, and what this said was, was that actually is enough. And so we set up spike net technology in 1999. That was me and Ruth and, and Arno, who were uh, my students at the time. They're, they're now both uh, research directors in, in, in my lab. Uh, uh, and the company has 12 employers, and we've actually managed to survive for 16 years. Um, you know, this is the sort of thing you get. You, you, you train with a patch uh, here, and these are red dots, the neurons that have gone over threshold. And so this is the original image. And you can see here that you can, you can mess around with the luminance and the contrast, and you can blur it and add noise, and all of these things basically have almost no effect. You can also change the size, you can change the rotate or, or orientation, you can distort it. Uh, um, perspective changes. You can do 3D rotations. You can change the, the person. So basically, the, it's, it's pretty robust. And okay, this is straight off V1. Okay, I haven't, I haven't even bothered with anything else. Here. So, what's the current state of the art? That was back in 1999. Things have moved on since then, and in particular, hardware has improved. So, um, the brain's got. 16 billion neurons in the cortex. This, this simulation's got uh, 16 million. So you imagine this with a thousand times more little flashing dots, and you've got something a bit like the brain. Uh, uh, in all, there are 86 billion neurons in the brain, apparently, of which 16 billion in the neocortex, about roughly, I don't know, 4 billion in the, in the, in the visual system. Firing rates never, I mean, in a real physical living, you couldn't get above a kilohertz. The real killer is the conduction velocity because the fibers in V1 projecting to V2 to V4 and so on, they're, they're about one or two meters per second. So doing that, you know, or the, the, the difference in latency between V1 and IT in the monkey for about 40 milliseconds is almost all conduction related delays. Because if you're 40 millimeters between V1 and IT, and you're at one meter per second, you've just used up your time and you, all you've done is send the signal which is another argument for saying that it has to be done very, very quickly on the basis of a very sparse presentation. <coughs> Brains only use 20 watts, which is pretty, pretty damn impressive, but now we've got it on the computer, you know, we've got all these graphics boards. You know, uh, this has got 4.5 teraflops and you know, thousands of cores and billions of transistors and the memory bus that are incredibly rapid. It gets, it gets hot. Uh, but it's in phenomenal processing power and because, because you know, the games industry is doing, you know, driving the technology. So um, the question, you know, uh, is that enough to uh, reproduce human performance? Well, until, you know, until relatively recently, I would have said no way. I mean, you know, um, brains are much better. Than but then, <coughs> ImageNet Challenge, this is the, you know, the, the big thing for computer vision people. Uh, they give you 10 million training images. So with, 10,000 labels, and, and you train your system with new images, with, with, uh, and then you have to test it with a thousand different labels. Uh, and, and I was at the European Conference on uh, Computer Vision in 2012. Actually, I was at a workshop, there were people like Jan Lacan who were there. 
and the, and the, and the place was you know, buzzing because the, the, the state of the art in computer vision had just been completely wiped out by uh, Jeff Hinton and his students with their supervision um, 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 system, which is just a, it's just a standard convolutional neural network trained with back propagation, which was, you know, various people discovered it, but, uh, but uh, Jeff Hinton had that back in 86, right? And, um, and so did Jan Lacan. Uh, and what's changed is the graphics boards mainly, which is just so fast, and you can train it with all this labeled data which they didn't have back in 1986. But basically, very little has changed. We had you know, 15 years, is it 15 years? No, 25 years, 30 years of computer vision still chasing after, uh, you know, trying to do it with you know, 3D models and all the rest of it. And, and yet, you know, basically the, the architecture was, was already there. So supervision. It's basically just an image comes in, you've got seven layers of neurons, you've got there's layers of convolutional layers, and a couple of fully connected layers, and an output layer. And you know, they, they, they tell you exactly what, how it's wired up. You know, the first layer has 96 filters, each of which is looking at an 11 by 11 patch, and then the next block has 256 filters looking at a 5 by 5 power, and you go through all this. And they, and they tell you for free what the, the 96 receptive fields are in, in, in block number one, uh, what you can call that B1 if you like, and they look like, you know, B1 Gabor patches, you know, and that was, nobody told it to do that, it was all done by, all trained by back propagation. So that system has 650,000 neurons, 60 million parameters to tune, 630 million synapses, a virtual one. And the results, well, I, I, so Alex Krzyzewski, the student who, who wrote the, the code to run this, uh, and he was very, very kindly sent me, um, when, when, this, when this came out, sent me some pictures of animals. That, uh, so these are just randomly chosen uh, photographs of animals. For each one, you've got the ground truth, if you like. This is what they, the correct answer is. And it gives you the, the five best, best bets of supervision. So this one, I've actually ordered the 18 in terms of uh, how well they're doing. So the, the, the length of this bar is how confident the system is that it is actually a sea slug. But, you know, if you had to, it could be a flatworm, a coral reef, sea cucumber, a coral. This is almost certainly a brown bear, but it could be an otter, a lion, an ace, ice bear, a golden retriever. Look at all this. This is all very sensible stuff. Um, this, this is, uh, I said this is a howler monkey. This is a spider monkey. I actually thought it was a howler monkey, so we got this one wrong. Uh, anybody here like to tell me which? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the mite here, I mean, it, it, it didn't get a very good signal here, but you still got it right. Uh, this one is actually wrong. It said it was a hognose snake instead of a night snake. Got this one wrong. It's probably it was a partridge instead of a rough grouse. That thing was a gorilla instead of a chimpanzee. <coughs> this one it thought was a chihuahua and instead of a Gordon setter. You can't even see the head of the thing. I mean, this, is, this, is, this is my idea of, you know, this is a terrible picture. And this is my, my favourite. The correct answer is a cherry. And the system said it was a Dalmatian. Oh, no, that's an error. Uh, it actually also said great error green current, which is... When I saw this, I, I just fell off my chair. I thought, this is ridiculous. I mean, you know, uh, I've got nothing to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> and of course, uh, as you probably know, Jeff Hinton and his two students in Toronto who set up a company called DNM Research and they well, got bought by Google. <laughs> and the other guy who was around in the, the 80s doing convolutional neural networks yeah. doggedly since the very beginning, Yann Lacan, and uh, it was ignored by everybody. He's been bought up by, uh, by Facebook. Mm -hmm. right? And everybody is doing this now, and they're, they're, that's the only that's the only thing that's, that's going. I mean, so Microsoft, you know, uh, and so on. Uh, um, what I find amazing is that the supervision you compare it with the primate visual system. It's uncanny, you know. I mean, the, the number of layers is the same, and things like this. There are we've still got more neurons in the primate visual system. This is Jim DiCarlo's picture. So you know, but. It, and the resolution of the image here is much smaller than ours, uh, than, than the Rattan, I guess. So it's a nice convergent evolution. I actually asked Alex Krzyzewski, I said, you, you, must, you must have just copied the visual system. He said, no, 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 we just, we just tried out a few things and that one worked. Um, I don't, probably, I don't want to go too much, but there's this fascinating question of what happens in the rest of this. You know, I mean, we know what the V1 does, what about these things? And there's this 
a great paper that I thoroughly recommend from Jim DiCarlo's group, where they actually did a, a, a real tour de force, where they had they were recording from arrays of neurons in IT and V4 in monkeys. They also had the human performance on, the, on actually quite difficult things. You have to name the category of the stimulus, and it's been to sort of pasted onto the things. And then uh, they've got neural activity, they've got uh, human performance, they sort of crowdsource it with Amazon Mechanical Turk to get human data on it. And then they've got this computer model, which is actually an even simpler model, it's only got four, up to four layers. Uh, uh, and they compared these models, and this is, they have various levels of difficulty. The high variation tasks are where the, the um, uh, the orientation and the size and the position are all varied uh, and so on. And you can see this is, um, this is performance for decoding from the IT, the, the infratemporal cortex neurons. Uh, and <coughs> doing a classifier based on that. This is human performance and this is uh, the HMO, it's the, uh, what they call it, the hierarchical mod modular optimization thing. It's a, a quite clever way of optimizing the neural network. But basically they're, they're pretty much up there. Uh, and the, the other thing is remarkable is if you compare the, the sort of selectivity profiles of the IT neurons with the, the top layer neurons, they actually look very similar. So we, you know, it's getting to the point where we can, um, you can use these sort of convolutional neural networks to try and understand the properties of neurons at the top end of the visual system. Um, it's, it's great thing on the blog, and Andres Carpathy, he was trying to compare his own performance with, with, with the uh, supervision thing. And he, you can go on his website and do this. Here's a, new, here's a picture, and you've got the 1,000 categories with 13 uh, sample images for each one of them. And you can just go wind through the 13,000 images and try and work out which one you think, which category you think is best. So it is me, you know, I was trying to work out, there are 60 dog breeds in the set, you know, I don't know why they have a thing on session with dogs. Anyway, so you, you sort of try and come up with your best uh, five things here. So I thought it was a Gordon setter, probably. The, this is the correct answer, it's Tibetan Mastiff. And this is the Google uh, net from the Tibetan Mastiff number one, Burmese mountain dog. This is the... Uh, and, uh, and so Andre uh, spent, you know, months trying to get as good as uh, uh, as, as Google Google's um, um, thing, and, and he was very happy, because like, uh, he got uh, my errors turned out to be 5.1 percent. Google Net got 6.8 percent. Way humans are still in front. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Microsoft Research Beijing, they're down to 4.94. Uh, we we the we're, we're doomed, basically, I think. And that paper got debunked, though, right? Sorry? That paper got debunked, the Microsoft Research China paper. Did it? Oh, okay. There were some irregularities. They, 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 they cheated. They cheated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just like yeah, that. I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, and faces, they're, they're also, you know, face <coughs> recognition. This is, this is, uh, who is it? Calista Flockhart. Well, I mean, the <laughs> systems that will, will do this for you. Interesting thing, these are all feed forward convolutional neural networks, and in a sense, you know, you, you can choose. I mean, I've already shown you our really, really dumb two layer network, okay, where we, the identification goes directly on V1. It's very, very expensive in neurons because you actually have to have you know, a detector for everything at every position and every size doing it that way. Supervision has seven layers. And actually, the Google Net thing has 30 layers, so um, they're all they're all basically the same thing. And it, it's a trade-off, you know. That this needs more neurons than this. This will run on a mobile phone. And I was talking to the um, uh, people from Google a few weeks ago, and the big debate was, do we put this for free on your mobile phone? That means mm -hmm. you don't even have to be connected to the net, and it will tell you what it is. And uh, apparently, I just read like literally yesterday, was it two days ago, Casey, right? It was you sent me this. Google have just released open source a whole pile of software. So the big debate in, in, in Google was do we, do we make it free or not? Um, and then I think apparently they decided to make it free. So you can expect to have you know, really high performance stuff real soon now. So, um, 
So, there are a whole, I mean, this is interesting, but it's, there's a whole pile of real, really shocking surprises for many of us because apparently you can get human levels of performance or even better with, a, with a, the most stupid architecture that you could imagine. There's no feedback, there's no horizontal connection, there's no top down control, there's no need for context. <coughs> no dendrites, you know, uh, these, are, these are point neurons, right? Uh, there's no complex channel dynamics, uh, there's no, there's basically only positive and negative weights. I'm not even sure about the negative weights, actually, I think it may be just running on the positive one. No, I think they are on the I think they are on the yeah, they, 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 yeah. But they, I mean, they don't, <laughs> there's not, nothing with any, any dynamics in it. No. Uh, there's no memory. Uh, in the sense that they don't, you don't, you know, the neurons don't have to accumulate. It's just you know one shot. You know each neuron calculates the answer. There are no oscillations. Sorry, no binding. Sorry, and uh, <laughs> no attention. Even worse, there are no spikes. <laughs> no. Um, so you know, uh, in a sense, uh, you, know, you might be thinking, well, what, you know, what are all these other things that we've, we've all been working on uh, going to do? I mean, how are we going to sell those oscillations to Google? I'm going to say, we don't need it. There's a, there, there is a, a big problem, and that's learning, because, uh, I mean, supervision uses this back propagation thing, which has been around since the you know, mid-80s at least, and it needs billions of cycles of, uh, of, of training data with uh, labeled data. Um, and the reason why actually Alex Krzyzewski managed to get this to work is because he was a really, really good GPU programmer and he got the thing to run in one millisecond per, per image. Or actually, he told me that he loads up 100 images and gets all 100 answers out in, in 100 milliseconds. Which is so he had this thing, this thing running in his bedroom um, during the training process. I think he had two boards, actually. But of course, it's totally unbiological. I mean, we don't we don't actually have to be shown uh, you know ten thousand pictures of a Tibetan mastiff. Well, maybe I do actually. But, I <laughs> but um, yeah, I think this is where we have to bring spikes back in again because um, there are some simple learning rules which I think uh, allow systems to build themselves and, and by using spike time dependent plasticity. So that's the idea that a neuron. Uh, an afferent that fires before the neuron fires is uh, is reinforced. I mean, this is heck, right? Mm -hmm. so, from, you know, but, um, uh, and you know, you get these sort of these sort of uh, these sort of modification uh, theoretical functions here. This is the the how much in advance the afferent fires before the neuron. If it fires just before it gets very strongly reinforced, if it fires just after it gets very heavily uh, suppressed. Actually, we use a simplified one. Um, uh, all synapses get depressed every time the neuron fires a spike, except um, um, the, the neurons, the afferents that fired just before. So this is a lot simpler. We can actually balance the weights. It's actually quite a useful trick. One of the natural consequences of this is that um, high synaptic weights will concentrate on early firing inputs. So if you have the same pattern occurring over and over again, you end up with all your weights on the early firing inputs, which is actually what we want. So here's a sort of simple toy situation. I've got a, a neuron with 12 synapses. Uh, they're, they're all got in, in, initially weight, got weights of 0.25. I set the threshold at three. Uh, that means that you need all 12 to fire to get the neuron over the threshold. And we're gonna have a repeating pattern. Here's this pattern that's gonna come in. Presentation one, here come the spikes. All the synapses get activated, neuron fires, they all fire before, they all get reinforced, so they're now a bit bigger. And now on presentation two, same thing, only now you don't need all of them, you maybe need nine, for example. So nine get reinforced and three get depressed. Third presentation, maybe you only need six, and so they get reinforced. And then maybe you only need three. Uh, and so with another couple of presentations, uh, just applying the same same trick over and over again, you've got to the position where you've got three potentiated synapses, nine, nine down to zero, and you know what's nice is it's the it's the three first spikes in the pattern. And remember, spike net is based on picking off the first neurons to fire. Um, so uh, with multiple units. Uh, you can have each of these neurons is actually interested in a different pattern. And I'm using inhibition between the neurons to prevent them from all learning the same thing. 
So here we've got a pattern here. Is that a good pattern for this? Well, actually, yes, because uh, those three are found by those. Uh, that is coincidence detection, by the way. Um, nothing very clever. And what's neat is that, you know, that, that, that will activate all four neurons. But this, this pattern will, will as well. So you don't, you know, even when it's embedded in, in something else, uh, then you can, find, you can find the patterns. And uh, you, can, you can easily add in a, the next neuron, the next layer, layer up. If all four of them fire, then something very special has happened. And it's quite right. There are four sets of coincidences. Certainly these, it doesn't actually matter to this circuit which order those these four packets come in. Um, so it's not true order sensitivity, but it's still very unlikely that all four neurons will fire. So this gives you quite good selectivity. Can we scale this up? Well, that's actually, that was a, very much a toy thing. But with Tim Maschelier, this is quite some, this is 2008, we simulated um, actually 2,000 afferents. So these are, uh, there are 100 here, but actually there were 2,000 of them. And each of those afferents is firing spikes, uh, um, uh, it's a random Poisson process, uh, totally un uncorrelated, it's just complete garbage, okay? But we randomly select a 50 millisecond sample from some subset, and we color them root and red here, and copy them and replace the existing spikes. So you can see, uh, because I've made them red, that there is something that repeats here. But imagine that they weren't red, and I could give you the, the great big printout with 2,000 afferents and say, you know, um, tell me what, what repeats, and it's, it's, it's a nasty problem. But the amazing thing is, one neuron with STDP will find that for you. Um, it's just an ordinary leaky integrated fire neuron. But here's the um, initial activity of the neuron. It's got lots of, it's got 2,000 weights, and they're all sort of low fire uh, synaptic weights. And so the neuron, and they're all very active. So the neuron's firing away quite happily. And then these gray bits are where the pattern uh, repeats. Every time the neuron fires during the pattern, you reinforce the afferents that were active just before, and you make it more likely to, to fire again to that same pattern. Within five seconds, okay, it's, we've only had a few tens of repetitions, the neuron is now firing exclusively when the pattern comes on. And if you wait a few minutes, because every time the neuron fires, you reinforce what was not active just before, it will actually backtrack and find the beginning. So this neuron is now, now firing within 10 milliseconds of those red spikes coming. And it did that with no help whatsoever. It just learns about things that repeat. Um, in another paper, we, we uh, Tim used a more sort of conventional convolutional neural network, and we looked at uh, training to make face selectivity. So we actually have three maps of neurons, red cells, green cells, and blue cells, which initially have random weights. And we're just presenting faces from the, the Caltech face database, and these are all fr frontal views of, of uh, faces on, on varied backgrounds. And initially, uh, the, 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 the neurons are firing, the red, green, and blue neurons are firing at fairly random places. They can fire on the background and so on. But gradually, these receptive fields are changing because every time the neuron fires, you're going to reinforce some, selectively some uh, neurons and uh, some inputs. And so you can see now the blue neurons are actually firing pretty reliably at the bottom half of the face. The red neuron at the top half of the face, and the green neuron is actually is tuning into the eye and the nose. It's only seen a uh, hundred or so images, and it's, it's now actually quite a respectable face detector. And, and certainly if you say red and blue and green in this position, it's, uh, uh, the probability of that happening without being a face is you know, almost zero. Um, so importantly, I mean, nobody told, told the thing to learn faces, and if you do the same thing with the, with the uh, Caltech motorcycle database, you get motorcycle selective neurons. That's flashed images. Um, we, uh, with my student, Olivia Beachley, we did a, another thing with continuous inputs. This was uh, using Toby Del Brook's spiking retina. So Toby Del Brook in Zurich designed this, this, this chip as a webcam, but instead of sending images, it sends spikes. And this is actually the output of this retina. Uh, it's 128 by 128 pixels. Each pixel either sends a, a, a one type of pulse, which means that the luminance has just gone up by 10%, or a, another type of pulse, the black dots, which is 
um, when, it, uh, when the luminance has dropped by 10%. And it remembers what the luminance was the last time it spikes. I and mean, it's, just, it's just comparing, and every time it's made enough of a change, it fires. Completely asynchronous, you know, it's microsecond precision. And you get all these spikes coming out. You probably, you, it didn't take you very long to work out what this is, did it, I suppose, right? Um, because you, you've all got, got visual systems. Um, but we, we, uh, we fed the, all these spikes into just 60 neurons with STDP. They've all got lateral inhibition so that they can't, they can't learn the same thing. And uh, we used our very dumb STDP rule. And here are 10 of the, uh, of the neurons. Initial connectivity, they're all random weights. Um, and then what's happening here, every time it flicks, it's the neuron, this is in real time actually, uh, uh, every time it flicks, it's the neuron's fire spike and it's modifying its weight. Uh, and so after, after just uh, 12 seconds, we're, we reach this stage, after 30 seconds, it looks like this, and after 90 seconds, we've got actually things that look like little cars. And why has it done this? It's because this, there's this bunch of spikes that all fire together, a set uh, within a, a, a short time, time frame, and uh, this particular neuron has learned to respond every time uh, the car goes by on a particular lane. And so you can actually use this to count cars on, you know, uh, on, the, on the different lanes of this freeway in Pasadena. And it did this in 90 seconds with no training, with no instruction. And, and, and you can imagine taking this camera and these 60 neurons and sticking them in all sorts of places, you know, watching airports or, you know, whatever. And you can imagine sort of quite interesting things like having a system that just learns about everything that happens normally. And then if you have some mo movement and it doesn't match one of the things you've already learned, then you say, oh, there's a problem, uh, there's something going the wrong way down the, the freeway or something. Uh, will it work with... Uh randomly interspersed multiple categories. So a couple of car images, a couple of monkey images, a couple of tree images. And we it. haven't done it, but uh, I, I, would, I, I would bet you any, any number of beers you like. But you know, as long as there are still some neurons that haven't learned something, you know, okay. uh, there will be other, you can take the camera. So, the, so there is the, the competitive stages at the end, so that the ones that do best initially with cars will keep anything else so to speak, and doing cars and so forth. Indeed, and in yeah, fact, okay. I basically, you know, we've only got 60 neurons here. I mean, what I want to do is um, not 60 neurons, it's 60 million neurons or something. Yeah. So it's a really yeah. big number. So there's plenty of space. And the in interesting thing is that you know this 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 neuron here, which is now a, actually a very selective face uh, car detector. If I gave you the, the camera and this uh, and this, this this you can actually simulate this on an FPGA. In, give you this device and I then say, okay, you get this neuron to fire. And so you're doing the neurophysiology, you're taking your Huberman Wiesel bar thing and you're waving it around and trying to get it to fire and you won't be able to do it. You can, you can point this anywhere you like. If you're not back in the right place with the car at the right size going in the right place, then, then you'll never get the cell to fire. And that's it effectively turned it into a grandmother cell in 90 seconds. It's a grandmother cell for cars in a particular location. And it's, it's not even, we're in the, the LGN here. I mean, it's directly off a very, very cheap. So it's learned to recognize cars. Um, no supervision. So my, my claim would be that, you know, maybe if we, if we, if we had a few more neurons, you know, let's uh, add some more layers and, and let's add, um, you know, let's have a bigger input resolution. Let's do it with full HD images. And, and now we can add some you know, more interesting, I mean, this, this just luminance stuff is, is obviously very primitive. Let's, let's have some you know, Mexican hat things or whatever, whatever you like. Convert your image into spikes and then just you know, uh, apply this learning process. Um, so I think I can probably just squeeze this in. Again, this is, this is, this is a, a sort of key idea here. Here's a neuron, it's got 40 inputs, and let's, let's suppose that four of them work, okay? And these 14 neurons sort of inhibit each other, so they, they, and as soon as one fires, then it makes it hard for the others to have fired. Let's suppose that this inhibitory circuit has a threshold of four. 
So if I take a, a, a particular stimulus and I, and I put it in at the front end, and I push the neurons progressively until four of them are fired, then, uh, then I know there are only four spikes, and I know there are only four weights. And you can sort of say, well, what's the probability that I hit the right four weights by chance? It's actually extremely low. It's, it, it's, you've got a hat with 40, black, um, 40 balls in it. Uh, four of them are white, uh, 36 are, are black. Put your hand in, pull out four, they're all white. Is that a surprise? You bet. And, uh, and this is actually the other trick with temporal coding is you, you can control the percentage of neurons that fire very easily. So you just sort of, uh, you know, um, just let the neurons fire and when they've got to a certain level, then you stop. And this is actually what Steve Ferber uh, called N of M coding. When you've got 100 binary neurons, there are two to the 100 patterns that you can get. That's about 10 to the 30. But if you control the number of neurons that have fired, or are allowed to fire, um, then you can calculate exactly how many different combinations there are. So with one neuron, then you can choose 100 possibilities. With two, you can have nearly 5,000. With three, it's uh, four, etc. So by the time you get to 10, there are 10 to the 13 different things that could happen. And if, you, if you've got a, a neuron with 10 synapses, and you know that there are 10 signups, and you know there are, there are only 10 spikes, you can calculate what the hit rate of, uh, of getting a particular number of hits. So here we've got, you know, there are 10 spikes and 10 synapses. 34% of the time, you won't get any of them active. 38% you get one, 90% two, 5% three, 1% uh, one, one four, 0.1% five, and so on. So you can work out the probability of exceeding the threshold. And basically, even with this really simple thing, you know, there's almost no chance of getting set by chance. So you can leave the thing running uh, with noise coming in, and it's, it, it'll very rarely go over the threshold. And that's with 100 synapses and uh, choose 10. A real neuron, it's like, you know, thousands, choose 50. Very, very selective. And so, um, these neurons can very easily go into a state where you can't get them to fire unless you hit the right set of uh, afros. And, and uh, my other talk, which, I, uh, which I'll be giving in Vancouver, is on the idea that um, we might maybe our brains are full of maybe 90% of the neurons never fire any spikes because they're waiting for some really obscure thing that you learned you know, 50 years ago, in my case, um, uh, to happen again. Uh, and I think that's actually a, a viable thing. It's, the, it's the, the theme of my current research project, which I've got this ERC advanced grant. It's on how we remember things for the whole life. This, I showed you the, the car detector, which basically is safe. It's, it'll never change. Unless you can hit it again with something very close to it, it will, it will never forget that, because it, won't, it can't fire any spice anymore unless you hit the right combination. And that's essentially what's going on. So, um, so conclusions on the sort of learning. I think error back propagation is totally unrealistic. Uh, you know, even Jeff Hinton is, you know, he, he tried to get unsupervised learning into his, into his system, but basically the back prop just you know, does it anyway, so that people can't be bothered. Um, but at, but at this sort of simple spike-based learning mechanism could be allowed to uh, get the system to build itself in a totally unsupervised way. Uh, and, you know, and I think it's possible we can build a lot of the visual system without labeling anything. You just, you just, you just learn about things that happen in, in, the, in the outside world. And so my final conclusion as well, you know, to summarize the talk, I mean, we have these <coughs> temporal constraints on vision. You know, the speed of uh, which you can make saccades to faces and things like this really are a major, major challenge. It looks like it's feed for neural networks. With SpikeNet, we already, already knew that you, know, you can recognize individual people in a pure feed forward network with only one spike per neuron. And I think the story with supervision and Google Net is that basically you know, extend that into a multi layer system and you can do, you can do what you want. I've been stressing the importance of spikes because you can get ultra fast coding with one spike per neuron. Um, you don't need red coding, you don't need floating point numbers, just picking off the first ones to fire. And we've got this very efficient STD-based scheme for unsupervised learning, which allows the system to sort of build itself. 
And in my final conclusion, I think that biological vision has been and will continue to be uh, an extremely useful source of inspiration for technology. And certainly, what I, I believe, I think there's quite a lot of the things that we've learned. We've learned by studying how brains do, and I think this is this is very much the ethos here. I think that by studying how biology does it and, uh, and trying to get with you know, computational models, we can we can you know we can actually converge to more you know, interesting solutions. Before we go to questions, I just want to uh, point out that Simon, uh, you're actually the uh, the first speaker of a new cooperation between two centers here at York. One is the Center for Vision Research, which you know well, that Lawrence is is heading up currently, and the other is a new center, uh, the uh, uh, Center for Innovation in Computing at La Sonde, which I'm setting up. So this is a, the first of our cooperations in order to host you, and I hope the first of many more to come. But you're our inaugural uh, speaker, so I really can of pleased with that. Uh, <laughs> questions? The reason I don't think John's out of a job is because you did his job for him before you started. You know, you, the, you're, you're showing these images which contain a single answer. You know, when you had the Dalmatian and the cherries, and, and, and it was joking, he, they, he got the cherries instead of the Dalmatian. Of course, the answer is that there are cherries and Dalmatians of there. And so normally when you look at a scene, there's, there's a million right answers. Yes. And uh, they're not pre-selected. You know, so, can you comment on, on, on I, that? No, you were almost asking me if, I, if I'm allowed to give the other bit of my talk <laughs> about, about what happens when you have... Okay, actually, am I allowed to just say exact, exactly that, that, that thing? These, these are labels from, from, um, um, uh, from Google Net. Um, actually, no, it's supervision. But, um, um, if you had an image, had it was just a combination of that, I presume uh, it will come out with all four of them. And I, uh, we know, in fact, that uh, uh, I, this example, it, it, it will come out with, with both. And that's a problem because well, it's, it's a good thing because you know it's obviously doing a good job. But in the real world, and I think we saw we were talking about this a bit last night, and it's absolutely this is this is where I managed to make friends with John again, and he gets back to have a job. The real problem is that um, there are attentional limits. You know, you, you, we used to think that we needed attention to glue the features together. It, uh, you know, all this convolutional neural network basically says that uh, you don't need attention to glue things together. But let's suppose you've got lots of um, lots of uh, things being activated. Well, that's not going to be much good unless you can sort which are which which are relevant. So here's a, here's a test for multiple object processing. I'm going to flash up four things. That, just see whether you can, um, how many of these you can get. Okay, are you ready? ready? That's hard. I mean, you probably, actually I have seen some people sometimes can name all four of them, but it's extremely difficult. Mostly it's two or three. I mean, some things, let's try another one. So, I mean, I suspect but we're probably processing all these things, but they, they compete with each other. And somebody has to win. And I think the intentional thing is, is the mechanism that kicks in and says, on this particular trial, I'm interested in, you know, let's see, I'm interested in, I, you know, Dalmatian pictures. And that's the one I'm going to notice. But it's, uh, I think, so I suspect that these are all getting processed. Little blips of activity in the top end of the visual system, but only, uh, you can't, you can't run them all. And you need an intelligent way to pick off the stuff you want, and that's that's where the attention comes in, and that's exactly what you're doing. Right. Yeah, I mean, in a real world, I mean, there are just too many objects in this scene, and you have to you have to pick off something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Obvious question, given given the ubiquity of feedback. In fact, in many areas, there's more feedback than feed forward. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly it's doing forward. something. Yeah. One thing it's doubtless doing is aspects of attention, but I find it hard to believe that it's doing nothing else, and in particular, 
there are things that you miss in 80 milliseconds. For example, the particular individual, whether they're happy or sad, perhaps, and uh, additional information that takes maybe another 100 milliseconds, which is time for several spikes and a couple of quick feedback. Yeah, but there, are, you know, there are indeed neurophysiological studies showing that the initial response of face selective cells may be able to tell you this a face, but then the, the, right. the, yeah, you probably think of the same one. And that does look a bit like a sort of constraint satisfaction or feedback based uh, thing. But you know, I think <coughs> I suspect that if you try and sell that to Google and say you couldn't do oh, much, <laughs> they, they, they'll probably say, uh, you know, no problem. But on, the, on what the feedback does, I would say one very important thing is um, scene segmentation. Um, if you want to pick up an object, you need to you know, have a line around the outside so you know where to put your hand. People in computer vision said, oh, we just need to segment the scene properly and then we can do the object recognition. Actually, it was completely the wrong way around. Object recognition first, you use that you, uh, with a bit of top-down selection. I'm looking for a cup because I'm thirsty, and then you sort of backtrack, and and, and you just sort of uh, do the you know. And you know all these Peter Rolf similar things with uh, you know the neurons in V1 will you know kick in uh, if if it's on the attended object uh, you know 60 milliseconds after the onset of the response. So that that's the feedback kicking in. I think you know that is a very very important part of what vision does, and you you need to segment. And computer vision from the late 60s onwards was never got anywhere. I hope there aren't too many people <laughs> <laughs> um, who were there around at that time. But basically, that was that was what we had. That was the first step, and they managed to get sort of block world things to work. And, and but basically, you took it to the real world. It never did because uh, I don't want to debate you too much about this, but I think there was a little bit more to it. And I, you know, I'll defend you know computer vision a little bit. Uh, but I think the important point is that, that uh, both you and Lawrence are raising with you is that um, human vision is not Google vision. Google's vis Google vision is specific to Google's business plan, which is on the internet. Images on the internet. I mean, there's nothing else. And human vision is not that. Uh, the breadth of, of visual competences and behaviors that humans have is very broad. And there's a lot of experimental work demonstrating all that breadth. And what these convolutional nets do is they address this very, very narrow slice that is appropriate for Facebook and, and Google. Uh, and we shouldn't extend that believe that they solve vision. The object labeling thing, I would say that they will probably be saying that actually it's not just for face, it's not just for images on the net. I mean, if you were to equip a camera with with all this stuff around the back, camera uh, doesn't just decay. Take... The camera, you decide no. where to point the camera. Okay. They have nothing there that will tell you where to point the camera. No. Other questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in your odd man out uh, situations that you showed way at the very beginning, where we all got the um, the Statue of Liberty, Mona Lisa, those were all the odd man out was something that was very, I guess, um, as you said, culturally re relevant. Um, and, well, yeah. and if you have something that isn't necessarily, like as it becomes more culturally obscure, that, that gets harder and harder to do. Is that not the case? Like, even if it is a distinct odd man out, like if you have one bird and the rest of the animals are, are mammals or something like that, it's a distinct odd man out. But I'm not sure anyone would pick that up if you. No, I think, I, I, the, actually, the animal category seems to be really quite special. Because everything gets lumped in, whether it's a, a birds or fish or insects or whatever. We, we seem to, uh, that, that's why that demo works particularly well. But um, does it have to be something culturally significant? No, I think a chair would probably, I haven't, uh, I haven't mentioned, I could, I could, we could set it up, you know, yeah. uh, uh, try it. To take a whole string of uh, animal pictures and throw, put in anything which is not an animal and see whether it pops out, I think it probably would do. So well, what a chair or a telephone or, you know. Well, the, the chair, you can almost presume it'd be like background or something like that, if you, because it's in a very different setting. If you had a chair, Sat maybe in a field. Oh, or right, like well, we have done we've done quite a lot of stuff with pasting animals and furniture into natural scenes, <laughs> and okay. um, uh, we're, we're very good at pasting yeah. animals. Uh, and not so good with furniture, actually. I mean, no. uh, uh, animals, you know, are particularly well processed, probably because you know it's it's pretty vital. Like faces, I mean, there's one thing you really want to make sure you find in any scene as fast as possible is 
animals because they might eat you. Or you might eat them. Or you might eat <laughs> <laughs> if, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're not vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yes. So when you did odd man out, and did you find calculating statistics on the photograph that the odd and on the photographs of the normal, you know, like any vision features statistics? No. And I'm saying, if I have this signature of the product discoveries of this and that, can I classify and tell me that this is odd? Well, I haven't actually gone through the boring and tedious stuff of proving that there is no low level feature which would be specific to the Mona Lisa or all of the etc. Uh, the reason why um, I rather hope that I don't have to bother is because we deliberately used an extremely wide range of animal pictures. So um, not that there's something that they all share. Um, so it just seems unlikely. I, th I think it's much more that they every one of those animal pictures is being processed, processed up to the Tibetan Mastiff level or whatever. And, and these are all being these are all being in competition with each with other types of representations, and at the animal category. I mean, I don't know whether you know this, but it's the e it's about the easiest thing to get if you've got a, you know the voxels in in higher visual areas. Uh, the easiest thing that fit and drop out is animate, non-animate. It's just really, really basic. So anytime, anytime that you're changing the category from there to something else. And it, the high-level representation changes dramatically, and I think that that's what makes the pop-out thing. So I, I think it, it's unlikely to be a sort of low-level thing. But you know, uh, I'm, I'm prepared to concede that I have proved the point, and, uh, and it would need to be tested. Actually, I haven't really done that experiment properly yet. Uh, so if anybody wants to pay for it, science do it. Um, uh, it, it it's, a, it's a neat thing. I've been doing that demo for decades basically and uh, it has the effect of convincing people that actually uh, it works pretty fast but in terms of doing that properly it would you really want to sort of go through and make sure that you've ruled out all the possible low-level cheat ways of, of doing that to pop out. I have a question. Yes. So you said you wanted to convince <coughs> me at the beginning of uh, the post box and you've done a very very good job. However, I have a question. <laughs> um, there are situations where this first spike uh, may not be representative of everything that is important. Uh, and I'm thinking, for example, of uh, the work from Charlie Gilbert's lab with respect to uh, the effect of lateral inhibition in V1, where if you have, uh, say, two horizontal lines with a gap, that the, that the neurons um, uh, on either side will increase their firing if, the, so if they're yeah. aligned and not otherwise. But that increase happens up to 300 milliseconds after stimulus onset. Or the work from Schroeder's lab where they're recording from neurons all the way in higher levels of cortex downwards and finding that the attentional modulation occurs much, much later than the first spike. What are those doing then, if it's if in heaven? Yes, okay, so I, I tend to sort of give the, the, the very strong version, which is to say you don't need formally to have maintained activity, but actually you do. I mean, uh, and there are, there are plenty of computations where you want to keep the neurons firing. And uh, the, the, my, my point would be not that you don't have maintained firing rate, because you do, and that's, that's what you do. You need to do this, the other stuff like top-down scene segmentation. You, the neurons have to keep firing to be able to do something that magically do this. So you do, you do need to keep the neurons firing. And things like Charlie Gilbert's uh, um, sort of Bernier judgments and things like this are sort of quite difficult things and they're not pop out in the snow. Uh, well, they're not pop out. Right? I, mean, I think Bernier the line in there is, is pretty fast. But um, yeah, no, you do, you do need to keep the neurons firing to be able to do um, the sort of more well, the bigger ground segmentation thing. I mean, I, I don't think anybody can do a bigger ground segmentation on one spike. I mean, uh, it has to keep firing to be able to do that. So I'd be tempted to, to that's my get out of jail card um, on that one. So yeah. Uh, the, so in other words, there could be a need for having some kind of a hybrid system yes. that would consider the temporal coding that early spikes provide, yeah. but marry that with something that looks at temporal durations and more, more... In fact, interestingly, the, the, the two 
two dimensions are actually you know, they're, they're not coding the same thing in many cases. Um, um, this is one this is one argument I can use is that you know the, the conventional view is that as you increase in service intensity, the firing rate goes up, the latency gets shorter. Actually, what what very often happens is as you increase the intensity of the stimulus, uh, your spikes bunch up and they get shorter latency. And in the end, you have one spike and that's it. There's very uh, the beautiful figures from the olfactory system where a weak stimulus produces lots of spikes spread out. And when you get a really strong odor, boom, you have one spike, really short latency, and everything else cuts out. Mm -hmm. In other words, a total anti-correlation between firing rate and latency. Uh, and, and same thing in the auditory system. Um, so you know, to, to, to be open to other possibilities, I would say, why not use them to code different things? Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you can use the, the maintained firing rate for doing other computations. So you know, I, I, would, I would say possibly we can do a hell of a lot on a, on a speed forward pass with one spike. That's what we were, we were claiming back in 2001 when mm -hmm. we did you know, face identification with one spike per neuron. I, at the time, I, I had no, I mean, we weren't even, you know, it was obviously just a completely toy system, nobody would ever dream of building a real brain like that, because remember there were one, there were a million pixels in the image, and there were 40 million detectors. Uh, it's just not a sensible way to build a brain. Um, you could, you could, it would be, it would be extremely fast, mm -hmm. if you've only got, you know, uh, one layer of neurons. Uh, real brains, it's a compromise, you know. You, you, do you go to 30 layers, or will you stick with seven? It, uh, and you, you basically this question of, you want to do, you want to be able to recognise big objects too, and scenes, and then to do scenes, you want the whole visual field processed, and uh, you can't do that in V1. You have to, you have to have big receptive fields to have. So my takeaway message is from your work that um, these early spikes are indeed important, but it's likely that we need to think of some combination or a number of different mechanisms that interact in order to deal with the full breadth of visual behavior. I'm happy with that. So could it be possible maybe oscillation could help? Like so you have like some kind of internal clock, so every time you hit the heel of the face you do the, the temporal ordering again and somehow yeah, it calculates again. So actually in the, the, the STDP learning thing, mm -hmm. so the f I showed you the first paper we had where we had these, the, the, the red spike patterns that yes. were embedded in, in background noise mm -hmm. and basically making them very difficult to find. There's another paper where we, where, where we had an oscillation on top. And when you have an oscillation on top, you're sort of taking all your V1 neurons or whatever and you're pushing them up and down. And even in a case there is a maintained activity, this is for you, John, even when the, the activity is maintained, impose an oscillation on it, and you can you can get the uh, recurring temporal pattern, which is easy to learn. In the olfactory system, there isn't a flash moment. Well, they sniff a bit, you know, but uh, uh, basically, olfactory is, is not very temporally structured. But if, if the, the uh, you have the oscillatory activity imposed on top, then that turns it into a into a very strongly uh, temporally structured pattern. And so, even in maintained activity, um, you can you can get the thing to go into a temporally structured pattern, and, and that's all we need for learning is that, you know something repeats. And, you know, so oscillations at whatever frequency you prefer, you know, whether it's gamma or alpha or whatever, could be a, a, a trick to help learning attention. But so, it, you know, the idea that attention by deliberately Getting the neurons to do this, is, it, it, it fits perfectly because it's going to, you know, produce additional temporal structure, which will make some bits of the image uh, uh, easy to learn and, uh, and more rapidly learn. You know, the print now, you know, turn on the oscillator and, and you know, burn in. Um, that, why not? I'm happy with that. Yeah. 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 Well, I want to thank you for that great talk. Evan. I've learned so much, and I'm, I'm even slightly convinced. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go celebrate that. <laughs>